So I'm Rob Tillis from Inner Circle Sports. We have, we're in very rarefied air for this panel of qualified people that are at the intersection of sports, real estate, and I guess some politics thrown in. Um, so to my left is Stephen Jones, COO, EVP of Player Personnel, President of AT&T Stadium, and Dallas Cowboys. A um, little bit, uh, Stephen will go through kind of what his role is, but as a reminder, AT&T Stadium was opened in May of 2009. I'm sure most of you have been there. It's spectacular. 13 million fans have gone through. They host high school, cotton college football, major college basketball, international soccer, bull riding. Ride that a little bit. Uh, I didn't get on the bull. Uh, uh, <laughs> super cross, boxing, concerts. I went to the NBA All-Star game there, which was spectacular. The Super Bowl, as well as the, uh, the star in Frisco, which I know you'll talk about in a minute. Um, Sam Kennedy, everybody, in the middle, everybody knows Sam, President and CEO of the Red Sox, NFSM, since 2002. Prior to that, San Diego Padres, and was an intern at the New York Yankees. <laughs> Little known fact, uh, Sam was the captain of his hockey and baseball team at Brookline High School with his fellow classmate, Theo Epstein. Um, Sam will talk about uh, Femway, the real estate projects they have going on there. Uh, Jeff Wilpon uh, on the left, um, 35 years overseeing major construction projects, the founder of Sterling Project Development, CEO of Alta Vista Partners, uh, COO of the, formerly of the Mets and the Brooklyn Cyclones, 18 years, Jeff, or about that. Um, just I'll give you a list of projects he's working on that you may want to ask questions about from Willits Point to Title Town, City Field, Target Field, the Mets Spring Training Facility, the Brooklyn Nets Training Center, Little Caesars, the UBS, and the NHL and MLB headquarters. So Jeff has a, a vast array of experience. So just to kick it off, um, perhaps each one of you can kind of, in order, go through kind of what your role is and how you have uh, grown the real estate within your organizations. Start us off. Start? Sure. Absolutely. First of all, great to be here. I see a lot of familiar faces, which is just uh, outstanding uh, to be in front of this group. Uh, certainly an honor and a privilege. I uh, always wish I'm doing these things uh, coming off a W, but uh, the good news is I just got word Dax practicing, so that'll, uh, that'll help us get over that tough Eagles loss. They've got a great team, and we've got some work to do, is all that says, but uh, we'll do that. But my role uh, within our organization, obviously, uh, partners with uh, my father, uh, my brother and sister, uh, Jerry and Charlotte, they all uh, play a role uh, in our organization. And uh, as far as mine's concerned, you know, focus really on the overall business of the Cowboys, very involved in our business side uh, in terms of uh, what we've done. As uh, you might be aware, AT&T Stadium, which sits on 120 acres, uh, we developed that, uh, believe it or not, we've been in that stadium now 13 years. Um, it was uh, 1.25 about 13 years ago uh, after what Mr. Kroenke just did. Uh, you know, right there in L.A. looking at uh, four and a half to five. I'm glad we're not having to build ours today because I'm sure it'd be a lot more than that. But uh, and then, of course, the star, which we'll talk about some as well. Uh, you know, our business of the business of the Cowboys, uh, very involved uh, in that uh, day to day. So anything that we, you know, want to touch on there, we can talk talk about. And then actually I'm very involved in the football side as well. Uh, work, uh, uh, you know, as you know, Jerry is the quote unquote general manager and uh, he can be a tough general manager to work for. But uh, between Will and I, we were able to keep that in, in a good place, I think. But, uh, you know, fired up about our football team. The biggest uh, issue we have right now is just uh, we haven't won a damn Super Bowl in, uh, I think, since we bought the team 30 years ago. So uh, we did get three under our belt then, but uh, that's what we're looking for, the hunt for Red October. And then uh, I'm also very involved, uh, as you said, in our real estate business, not only as it ties to our football team, but we also do that uh, as one of our uh, main pillars, one of our main legs of our stool. Uh, we're involved in the real estate business when it doesn't involve the Cowboys. And then, of course, I'm sure a lot of you are aware uh, Jerry and myself, I was a chemical engineer in school, went to work in our energy business uh, right out of college, and we're involved in a public company called Comstock. So that's a little bit of my background. It makes for uh, 
uh, juggling a lot of balls, but uh, have a lot of great people uh, that work in our organization and, uh, and makes, for, uh, makes it a lot better uh, when you have great people that work for you. Well, it's, uh, my name's Sam Kennedy um, with Fenway Sports Group, and Stephen, it's great to follow you. Um, and closing with people, um, I think it's a great segue. Uh, just, I won't go through um, you know, the different organizations within Fenway Sports Group other than to say um, we have an amazing team of people at each of the, the organizations. And Rob, my role day to day is to manage uh, the people, the, the, the team of folks who work on the Red Sox and Fenway Sports Management, our real estate company, um, Kevin Acklin, our president from the Pittsburgh Penguins, uh, is here today. Um, and then we, of course, uh, invested in Liverpool Football Club back in 2010. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of fun. Uh, we have real estate probably in the worst weather climates on God's green earth, Liverpool, Pittsburgh, and Boston. Um, so we're looking for another asset, maybe in a different, warmer place at some point. But um, it's a great group of people, uh, and at the end of the day, that's what we focus on is the talent development, uh, retention, and trying to provide opportunity for people across Fenway Sports Group to take on more and more and, and grow within our organization. Hi, Jeff Wilpon. I'm really happy that I don't have to worry about wins and losses anymore. <laughs> it's, uh, it's definitely put some years on my life, but now I'm doing what I really love. I grew up in the real estate business. I grew up with construction background. And now through SPD, which is our project development group, and also Alta Vista, where I've teamed up with a private equity real estate shop that's got a large, large slug of money that we can put out to be investors and partners with different sports <laughs> organizations as they're doing uh, venue-related uh, upgrades and or doing uh, ancillary real estate in all the different areas that we've seen out there. So we're excited to do some more of that across the country and uh, do more things like we did it uh, with the Packers at Titletown. What we're trying to do 12 years later, still trying to do at City Field, across the street at Willits Point and uh, some of the other locations, we're, we're very much in, in the mix to, to do some other big, big projects now. Great, so Stephen, how much does the Cowboys brand matter in, well, it matters worldwide, I guess, but when you're going to do a real estate project, uh, in, in a locality, are you telling the municipality, hey, we're going to bring our brand, we're going to bring X number of people, so when you're developing a practice facility or other places that the city really latch on to that um, versus if you didn't own that? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that comes into play when you involve uh, the Jones family slash Cowboys with our brand is you have to do it to the utmost quality. And I think if you look at AT&T Stadium, uh, you look at the 90 acres that uh, the star sits on with our practice facility. Uh, we partnered with, a, uh, believe it or not, in Texas. They'll give you uh, $90 million to build a high school stadium. And uh, uh, that's how important football is in Texas. So it's a good place to be in the football business. Uh, but you have to do things the right way. And, uh, uh, and you want that reputation when you're going. And the one unique thing about North Texas, as I skip around a little bit, is they have all these cities within the bigger city in North Texas. They have a Frisco. You have Arlington where our stadium is. Frisco is where the star is. You have Dallas. You have Plano. You have the next cities that are moving out. And, boy, it's like a bulldozer uh, coming that down that tollway in Dallas. It's hard to go wrong uh, if you do things the right way. Uh, and you have the patience to hang in there. So it's a, uh, but if you want to pull the brand in, which we do, uh, give you a quick story real quick. We actually developed some apartments, 2,500 units uh, down in Austin. And we gave away, uh, we had a little run there where we were trying to lease some units. And if you lease during that time frame, you got a trip to uh, go to the Cowboys and uh, go to the sideline. And our management passed out. Uh, shirts to all the people who rented an apartment said I live in Jerry's place go Cowboys <laughs> but you have to do things the right way you can't you can't gouge them you got to make them feel good that they're getting a premium uh, for what you're giving them whether it's an apartment building whether it's a retail building whether it's a single family uh, subdivision uh, we put when we put in the weight rooms at different multifamily places we put you know the pictures of the Cowboys we, we give them that or but it's got to be done right. And 
uh, that's the biggest pressure because, boy, if you happen to slip up and, and the power doesn't come on or something's wrong with the plumbing or things don't work, it's going to be front page in the Dallas Morning News. It's not like a typical developer that they're going to let that slide under the rug. You're going to have to deal with some mad customers. You're going to get written about front page headlines. So, you know, we just are very convicted that uh, although uh, you're putting a premium, uh, you're spending more money uh, on a cost per foot basis, you're, uh, you, as you build up your project, uh, you've got to believe that you can get that back in uh, premiums on your rents, on premiums uh, on what you sell that particular project for because you did it the right way. And uh, we're just so fortunate, as you said, we're not, in a, uh, we're not up here where it's cold and snowing all the time. <laughs> I mean, we've got some great weather there in Dallas. Uh, we do have people who uh, happen to love the Dallas Cowboys, and uh, uh, there's enough of them to sell to that love sport, that want to be motivated by sport. We had Lincoln, uh, a group uh, that was helping us lease our property, and we were meeting. Jerry and I were meeting with them, trying to get them motivated about leasing up the office space, uh, leasing up the retail space. And one of the young men asked the question, well, uh, what happens if they're not Cowboy fans? And I said, move on to one that is a Cowboy <laughs> fan is what you do. There's enough of them uh, to lease those buildings out there. Jerry used to say uh, about our stadium, it's really not that hard when you live in a Metroplex at seven plus million bucks. All you got to do is five, 25,000 accounts that want to buy a season ticket. Now, we're not going to get ever, ever tenant. We had one tenant come through, a medical user uh, that was coming from California, and they finally just said, boy, as much as we love the star, all our people are coming from California, and they're either Rams fans or 49ers fans or Chargers fans. And we're going to have to go down the road. And we said, well, that's part of it. We'll find a group that wants to, uh, that wants to bring their group in here and are, uh, are fired up about being around the Cowboys, being around competition, which we really find to be the case. I mean, a lot of these companies are motivated uh, by the atmosphere of competition. And they want that in their company. They want that with their people. And uh, we find that that really resonates with the CEOs of companies, the decision makers that come in here that want to be a part uh, of competition. So uh, probably over my limit. No, so. you're good. <laughs> uh, Sam, I think um, most people are familiar with the fact that Fenway Park was renovated. It was a major decision to not build a new stadium. And the ballpark is great. I don't think people are probably less familiar with what's going on around Fenway, particularly the MGM Music Hall, which I've been to. Can you kind of just elaborate in terms of like, what Fenway Park and that surrounding area will look like in 10 years from now? Sure. So <clears throat> coming in, this is my 21st year with Fenway Sports Group and uh, same with the Boston Red Sox. <clears throat> when we came in, believe it or not, there was a big question of what to do with Fenway. Um, the ballpark at the time was 90 years old. It was in need of a lot of uh, investment, tender, loving care. And frankly, there was a movement uh, to try and build a new ballpark somewhere else. Um, we were blessed uh, with an ownership group and specifically um, my mentor, CEO Larry Lucchino and uh, Janet Marie Smith, who's a brilliant design architect. They worked on Camden Yards together. They worked on Petco Park. And our group decided to preserve, protect, enhance, expand Fenway Park. Um, so everything we've done there has been sort of with the Hippocratic Oath of do no harm uh, to this incredible venue. Uh, we've put $400 million plus into Fenway itself uh, over that time period. Uh, and we sort of, we call that playing defense to save Fenway, to expand it, to enhance it. Now we're trying to play offense. Um, and I love listening to Steven talk about sales meetings with Jerry Jones. I get fired up. I would have loved to have been <laughs> in one of those leasing meetings. Uh, I'd love to get my 19 year old son in that room and get him going. Um, but we really focus on the total 360 um, degree experience of Fenway. Uh, you mentioned the MGM Music Hall at Fenway, uh, $150 million project, 5,500 capacity, about 4,999 seats. Um, we opened with Bruno Mars and, and Chris Stapleton, James Taylor a few weeks ago. Uh, we're off and running, and it should bring another four or 500,000 attendees to the Fenway neighborhood. Clear, Sam. Yeah. That's in. That's beyond right field in a self-contained 
uh, building that's attached to Fenway Park. Yes, it's in what we used to call the Triangle Lot, where the TV trucks uh, parked uh, who were doing the games. We had to move them across the street to another location, but immediately adjacent to Fenway Park. If you're standing on home plate and you look out to the right field, of course, the, the monsters in left field, the bleachers in right field, immediately behind the right field bleachers uh, is this new music venue, uh, part of a strategy to sort of use Fenway as the anchor and redevelop the entire neighborhood. We're working with the city of Boston, the Boston Planning Development Authority right now um, on a project that calls for about 2 million square feet of development uh, across about eight acres of land uh, adjacent to Fenway. So trying to follow what, what Stephen uh, has done, um, albeit at a, at a smaller level, um, what Jeff and, and his company have done. Um, it really is about preserving Fenway and, and improving the experience. And when we go and, and look at investments that we're making in sports, whether it was Liverpool or, or Pittsburgh more recently, we're always looking at the real estate. We're looking at the venue. And the first question we ask ourselves, this sounds a little creepy, but is this a place, is this a venue where when, you know, grandmothers, grandfathers pass away, would you like to sprinkle their ashes, you know, at this venue? Is, it, is this venue that important? in this community, in this region? And if the answer to that is yes, it becomes more of a no-brainer. And we think uh, we have that in Pittsburgh. We certainly have that in Anfield and, and at Fenway. Um, and so our job is to protect those experiences, those venues, and enhance them now with ancillary development in, in all three arenas. And what's the development that'll be going up beyond the, uh, beyond the concert venue that'll be going up around Fenway? Around Fenway, yes. Yeah. So we're looking um, at retail, uh, residential, lab space, hotel, ground floor entertainment, um, all immediately adjacent to Fenway Park on Jersey Street, Brookline Avenue, Lansdowne Street, and Van Ness Street. Uh, we started acquiring parcels back in the early 2000s when we arrived, sort of in a, in a more defensive posture. Uh, and now we want to proactively develop those areas in partnership with the neighborhood and, and the community to make sure that, that we have great 365-day-a-year opportunities for our fans and, and our patrons. And Stephen and I were joking, but it, it's cold in Boston in the winter, so we have to come up with things outside of baseball that people can do indoors in December, January, and February, and March. Uh, uh, so, so you'll see uh, a lot of that activity over the next decade. Uh, we've been in front of the city working on entitlements and, and permitting for the last several years, and we, we hope we're getting close to the goal line, to use a football analogy. Great. And Jeff, when you look at these various projects that you're working on across the country, what are you, what are you looking for? What are the basic tenants that you're looking for vis-a-vis -vis the real estate crossing over into the sports? That's question one. Question two is then... How difficult it is it to negotiate an interface with, with, a, with a sports team or a municipality? Talk about some of the challenges there. Well, I'll answer the second one first. The sports teams are great. That's easy because we're being brought in by them or working with them. And I understand my, my space now is not to be the owner. I have to advise the owner. And I have to advise the ownership group to what's best for them. I might have an opinion on something, as I did with Scott Malkin numerous times at UBS. He had a vision for what he wanted for the arena. And at the end of the day, his vision is what we have to carry out and make sure it gets built on time and on budget for him. So that, that's the easy part. The municipality part, and depending where you're working, is extremely difficult. I'm surprised Sam's only two years in. I'm sure they bow, <coughs> excuse me, bow down at the Cowboys in Dallas uh, for when they come in the door, they, they just kiss the ring and go. But uh, <laughs> there's... Uh, there's different places that you like to work, and there's other places that are really difficult to work, and AKA New York. I mean, we're 12 years into trying to get something done across the street, and still uh, we've only remediated part of the land there. So that's, that's what happens sometimes. Uh, but we're, we got, we're the lead de development partner for the Ottawa Senators now, and the city and the, uh, the state of Canada has the country, really the government has gotten really behind that project and is pushing it very much forward even though they're going through an ownership change right now. So it really depends where you're at. But, but back to how you work with ownership, it, it again is it's their deal, okay? We're being brought in to do ancillary real estate with them. It's gotta all fit together and we know our space. But like for UBS, which we helped finance, yeah. they're the, can you talk a little about the ancillary development around that stadium and what how that came together and kind of your, your role specifically in that, 
in that well, building. Well, Scott was nice enough to ask us to partner with him on the arena, which we did. And then he asked us to partner with him on doing the uh, ancillary real estate, which is going to be a, uh, a value retail uh, development, which is going to be uh, off, off market, sort of high end retail uh, shopping outlet, uh, walking streets. He's got the highest grossing uh, locations in the world in uh, Bister Village outside of London, in Paris, in China. And his his brand really brings a lot with uh, very high end brands where they do off off label and you know lower price things, and it'll be a walking village. And then we'll add on to that and do a hotel as well. So a little different from them actually owning the real estate as part of their organization. How do you think about like returns? How do you model that for the different projects you're working on well, all over the country? If, if you look at the Packers, they really didn't need a return. <laughs> they don't want to return the money to the players. And uh, they, they want to put as much money into the community as they can because they're owned by the community. So very different there when you're looking at return. So we put very little money in that project. They, they asked us to invest, but they don't need my money. Uh, so that one was easy. When you're doing something with Scott where you're trying to get commercial uh, returns, you know, you're talking trying to get mid-teens on, on that. Uh, and probably higher on the retail and even higher on the, on the hotel once we do that. Got it. Steven, back to Frisco for a second, the star. I'm not sure everyone is as familiar with the star. Um, I've been there, but maybe not. Can you kind of give an overview of what the star actually is, what the strategy was for it, kind of the mission, and ha any challenges in terms of ex executing? I know there's a new phase even coming up now. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll steal a little from Sam to start with uh, that I didn't hit on the last time, as I do believe at the end of the day in real estate, we've all heard this term, uh, what's important, location, location, and location. And at the Star, we have 90 acres. And uh, as I said, the city had budgeted to build a high school stadium to compete with Allen, to compete with uh, McKinney, the other communities in the area. They had a budget of $90 million for a high school stadium. So Jerry had told me very eloquently uh, when I told him about building a practice <laughs> facility. He said, I'll leave that for you and Jerry and Charlotte to mess with. I don't do projects that don't have returns. And so back to your return. And uh, so when I walked him through that we had a head start on a practice facility and 90 acres in the heart of the watermelon on the tollway and what we could do to get the quote unquote return that he would be happy with, the next thing I knew, that was Jerry's project. <laughs> so, uh, he, he became all in and all behind it. But it does have 90 acres on it. We ended up not only building that high school facility, which is a la a college experience. You have the, on, on one side, you've got the 12,000 seat indoor high school stadium and four locker rooms on the high school side. And then on our side, it's like a university. We've got our locker rooms, our coaches' locker rooms, our player locker rooms. We call it the football. Uh, side of our facility and a top floor. I mean on the second floor. We have our coaches and scouts and, and then the retail starts above it We have a Dallas Cowboys Club. We have a Cowboys fit, you know a number of different concepts We have a hotel. Uh, we partnered with a, a great gentleman the a rolling family and uh, Omni Hotel sits right there on site. We have 12 uh, which is a high-end uh, multi-family uh, tower, if you will, because multifamily is becoming a bad word in that area. They, they want less and less of it. Uh, but anyway, we've developed through, uh, we're right at uh, a billion and a half dollars that we've developed so far. Uh, it sits on 90 acres. So the, that represents about 3 million square feet as we sit there today. And we probably got about 30 acres of the project left to develop and to be determined as exactly what, what the concepts will be. But uh, it is right there. Uh, have the Cowboys energized it? Have the Cowboys made one plus one equal three rather than two? I believe it. Now, at the same time, to give you a quick comparison, at AT&T Stadium, that's 120 acres. The postage stamp is 75. We have 50 acres of uh, 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 parking fields, if you will, and uh, hadn't gone vert, no parking garages on it. But right next to us, uh, the Cordishes and the Tishes and the owners of the Rangers have gone in and built a live concept. And of course, the Tishes have a thousand room convention hotel under construction right now and 300 rooms. Now, we haven't put one bit of development 
around our stadium because it's not necessarily like going down the tollway in Frisco. So you just don't take the leap of faith out there. Now, I think their live concept does well when they're playing their 80 games. If you go there, it's lively. If they have a concert, if we're playing our football games and our concerts and our one-off events, then the retail concepts does well. But it's still a struggle out there in Arlington to really get that to spin on a 365-day-a-year basis. So we're rooting. No one's a bigger uh, rooter for the Tishes and the uh, Cordishes than we are because we have land that butts right up against it. Uh, around our $1.2 billion uh, investment we made in our stadium, and we would love, love, love to be able to go vertical, build office buildings, build hotels, do those type of things, but we just don't think it's, it's quite ready yet. So uh, it's, it's a great uh, uh, challenge, if you will, uh, to have, and we certainly think at some point in time it will happen around AT&T Stadium, but in the meantime, the star where it's located in the heart of the watermelon in terms of North Texas development, which is one of the hottest markets in the country. Uh, we're, you know, just feel very fortunate that we get to combine that brand uh, with those concepts. Great. Sam, when you guys um, acquired Liverpool Football Club, the stadium was uh, needing some, some TLC. So there was some challenges that it reminds us that these are special purpose assets, special purpose buildings. What were some of the issues you dealt with in terms of expanding Amfield, the fan base, the physical real estate, and what are your future plans for Amfield? Well, if anybody's watching, welcome to Wrexham right now. Uh, that, was, that was us, uh, except we weren't celebrities. Um, no, we, we, uh, we found um, a, a unbelievable facility, uh, a venue, you know, that that means so much more than football uh, or soccer uh, to um, the community. It's literally a place where generations have shared memories um, and, and made connections and bonds unlike anywhere else in sport, if you think about what Anfield means uh, in Liverpool. That said, when we arrived, um, it, it needed some significant investment. There was no premium offering to speak of, um, not a, a lot of focus on food and beverage uh, or game day experience, uh, to say the least. Uh, there had been talk about building uh, a dual build with Everton across Goodison Park and maybe building you know, one venue for, for both clubs. Um, I can assure you, that was a bad idea or would have been a bad idea for us to come out and be in support of for reasons um, that probably seem obvious now to people who understand global football. Um, so we made the decision to do uh, almost exactly what we did at Fenway Park, preserve Anfield, protect it, expand it, enhance it. We've invested several hundred million pounds into the facility. We've created a, a new main stand, uh, an Anfield Road stand that's coming online, um, all inside the venue to bring people into the games, to the matches earlier, uh, to enhance the experience that they have there. Um, it's obviously a lot more difficult when you're managing uh, design, build, construction from 4,000 feet away uh, over in Boston. So we opened a, a commercial office uh, in Liverpool and in central London uh, to manage the process. Uh, and I think it's been received well. We're still small uh, in the Premier League in terms of the size of the venue. There's still a lot of frustrated demand for, for tickets and access, and, and we think that's okay given how special uh, the venue is. Um, and we'll see what ancillary development might be possible. It's, it's, it's far more as residential as Fenway is. Fenway's zone for entertainment um, and hospitality and, and, and retail and, and other types of activities. Anfield sits in a residential neighborhood. So uh, we have to be mindful of that, respectful of the community there. Um, so you'll probably see us focus more inside uh, than outside. Great. Um, we'll take people that want to come up and ask questions. Um, step right up. Um, Jeff, in terms of um, Title Town, can you talk a little bit about that project? I've actually not been out there, um, A. And then B, I think there's a separate uh, early stage fund that you guys have uh, been involved in. And right. 
what's involved in uh, Title Town. So Title Town started as uh, just some land across the street that uh, had a bunch of different kind of shops, garages, um, mixed use, a big Sears or Kmart that was there. Luckily, I went to grade school with Eddie Lampert from uh, Sears and Kmart. And uh, Eddie never got a call like I gave him. I <laughs> called him up and said, listen, we'd like to give you some money. He was always used to high school friends calling him and say, I need money. Yeah. So he was, he was very happy to take that call. We bought him out of his lease, and that locked up a very big piece of the site that enabled us to do everything we did. So we did a Bellin Health Center, local health uh, group that came in there and, and wanted to expand regionally, so they, they came in. Uh, we did a Kohler Hotel, Lodge Kohler with, with Mr. Kohler, wanted to do the hotel. He's on the board of the uh, Packers as well, so he was very excited about doing something right across the street. And then we did a, a beer garden concept, and believe it or not, this is where the uh, economics come in. The Packers wanted to do a sledding hill and not only just an ice skating rink, but an ice skating pond where you could skate around uh, the sledding hill and the, and the building that that occupied. So that was done as well, which is not a, a money maker, but people love it. They come out all the time and use it. Uh, it's a great tailgating space. A full-size football field was done there. And then we've now done an office building that uh, goes to what you were talking about, is Title Town Tech. We partnered with Microsoft, Delaware North, the Packers, and myself to do a fund for Midwest uh, entrepreneurs and startups. And that's the, gone really well. Fund two has just started. Uh, Microsoft again came in with a, a much bigger check this time. I'm involved with it as well as, as an investor with the Packers and, and a bunch of others. So that, that's really an incubator and that takes up some of the office space. And then we've gotten uh, a bunch of residential done as well. Some apartments and some townhouses that are being sold. So like Shark Tank for the Packers. <laughs> a little bit, yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Go ahead, please. Hi there, my name is Tim Kyle, Tech Ventures. Uh, my question is for Stephen, and it's more from the In doing the development with the Star, looking back at it now eight years later, what uh, components were absolute must-haves to making a 365-day destination out of the gate beyond the tollway access? But you know, you've got hospitality, recreation, the medical center, the practice facility. Like Looking back at all of that, what are absolute must-haves for 365-day out of the gate? And what's some other stuff that maybe is more of a phase two and how you plan that all out? Well, I think uh, the, the must as we started going through it, and boy, this thing evolved. It didn't just say, here's the master plan, and we're going to live with this one master plan. There's been 20 machinations on the, on the master plan. But to finish up where we were, obviously, we put the initial office building, which was 400,000 square feet. Uh, some of, I see some of our partners in here, Bank of America and Merrill Lynch was a big tenant of ours. People who do our insurance, FM Global, a uh, big part of, uh, of the star out there. So we had partners who naturally wanted to come off us there because we're fortunate enough to be in a great market like North Texas. But then we went to the medical component, which I think I left off. Uh, we really felt like if people looked around at the star and what the Cowboys are about, if your son uh, in a big high school market or playing little league football uh, hurts his shoulder, he wants to go fixed by the doctor who fixed Tony Romo's shoulder or Dak Prescott's shoulder. And we were able to sell our hospital, our doctor of the Cowboys, on putting a medical facility out there, Baylor, Scott, and White. Uh, we were challenged with retail. We wanted to have entertainment, but they have the highest grossing mall literally across the street, uh, the tollway uh, there. And it's a you know, big high-end retail, so we're about 200,000 square feet of retail. Predominantly, though, entertainment, restaurants. We do have some specialty retail, which I think is very helpful because one of the things we wanted to accomplish with the Star was live, work, and play. And so you can live there, you can work there. We have over a million square feet of office. Uh, doc, uh, Keurig Dr. Pepper, one of our big soft drink categories, they came in and put 400,000 square feet. They took the whole building, uh, and they're, they overlooked the practice uh, facility right there. They're, uh, at the time, their chairman, Bob Gamgort, uh, committed to it and thought it would be great for their employees to be involved, uh, that type of thing. So, you know, I think to have a complete mixed-use component was big. Uh, we're looking for the next unique concept. But right now, I'd say we're basically, you know, high-end multifamily. Uh, we're medical and we're office. And 
then of course you have the cowboy component, which if you ever go or have ever pull it up, uh, you, can, you can certainly know the Cowboys live there. And we live on that. And if you're not a big Cowboys fan, then you, <laughs> you may not want to be working through there. But uh, we do get a lot. And of course, we do tours uh, through our building all the time. Uh, I think we're, uh, I don't have the exact number, so I don't even <laughs> want to guess. But we do do tours out there at the Star and continues to work. But the great thing is, and what excites us the most, is the 30 acres that we have left. And well, like I said, it could it be more office? It could end up being more office. Could it be a boutique hotel? Could it be a boutique hotel? We'll see. Uh, but the, the great news is we actually have a, a water detention pond that we've made look like a lake, if you will, uh, with a big fountain in it. <laughs> and uh, so we think there's some unique opportunities we could have there uh, for some uh, retail type concepts, entertainment uh, concepts, maybe small amphitheater type things that y'all have done. Uh, those are kind of a big, you know, an overview of the star in there and what we feel like we have to have, but we're always eyes wide open on the next uh, unique concept for the star. Great. Um, any, anybody can jump in on this question. Um, so with rising inflation, higher borrowing rates, how's that, I guess, particularly for Sam and Jeff, for your future projects, how's that, is that going to require like scaling back in terms of, you know, returns are going to be a little bit lower with with higher cost how do you sort of how do you guys think about that for your future projects it's going to require jim nash <laughs> I, I was going to say the same thing bank of america here we come <laughs> look we're we are in uh in in a, a new world um trying to figure out what's going to happen three four years from now if anyone can tell you they're lying and no idea i think the the good news is, and Jeff, as a team owner, from his experience as a team owner and operator, and Stephen, the same thing. I mean, we're we're in this for the long haul. You know, we started our our, our investment came together in 2001, 2002. We closed, um, and while we've added assets and franchises and real estate to the portfolio, um, we're we're in in build. Uh, and invest for the long haul. So we're, our time horizon is um, forever, uh, especially when it comes to our real estate activities. So uh, we are taking a very long view and, and, and we don't have the typical um, uh, expectations around quarterly returns, annual returns, because we are in it for so, so long. And it, it's a two-pronged strategy. It's Yes, we need a good economic deal on the real estate that we're developing, but we also have to make sure it's additive to the fan experience, to Fenway, to Anfield, to PPG. I'll just add to what Sam just said. It's, it is the long term. So, you know, exit strategy for team owners is very different than a normal real estate developer. One of the projects we were working on, we just had to take the land value and cut that in half, basically and put that to the end of the deal. The, the, the team owner will get their money back, it's just on a longer horizon so that we could get some return go up front. So we just took a portion of the land value that they had or originally attributed to the site and said, okay, take half of that, move it to the back end, give us a return up front, and then from there we'll, we'll catch you up on your land value. Since they're gonna be there forever, it's gonna be with the team forever, even if it's not a different ownership group, uh, that worked out pretty well. Do you have a question? Yeah. Hi. Joe Donnelly, San Antonio Spurs. Outside, obviously, of your own projects, what are some other projects you guys like to as good examples of kind of that mixed use, sports, entertainment, community projects? That's easy. Um, if you haven't been to Tampa to see what Jeff Vinnick is doing down at Channel Side, go. Um, I think it's 54 acres um, and just bringing – sort of the model approach to the arena uh, and then to the, the mixed-use development he started with immediately adjacent, and now he, he and his team of people are rebuilding the entire city uh, of Tampa. It's absolutely extraordinary. I toured it a year ago, uh, so I'd love to go back and see what it's like now, but it's just uh, jaw-dropping. I mean, we talk about six, eight acres in Boston, or, you know, we had 28 acres in Pittsburgh that we're, that we're looking at, and we're coming out of the ground with an office tower now, but, um, you know, think about 54 acres, that's, that's like North Texas, uh, but if you haven't been to, to Tampa to see it, go, go check it out, and I got no commission for saying that. 
I would throw in SoFi as well. Uh, they just put NFL Films right next to what I think is one of the prettiest stadiums in the world. And uh, uh, they've got NFL Films going there. Stan is a tremendous developer with a long history. Uh, as you, you know, he's one of, involved in the Walton family, is a Walton family member by marriage, but he's a, an amazing developer. He's a great guy to visit with about development and what that piece is going to look like when it's all said and done. I think it's going to be fascinating. What we uh, did with the NFL Films building with SoFi as a backdrop and how it's going to, you know, really loop in sports and what they're about. Now, he's got a big piece of real estate for Los Angeles, and uh, that'll probably go way past Josh and even Josh's kids when they're all said and done with that. But it's certainly, if you're into, you know, into looking around real estate, around sports, uh, then I would certainly stop by there, and I agree. One of the unique things about being involved in real estate and sports is it is the long haul. And uh, uh, you want it to be, you want it to bring value to your brand, value to your franchise, and that's the way we look at it. And you don't want to be doing something just to be doing it because you're in a hurry. I'll, I'll, I'll just throw in the Braves. I mean, what they did at the battery and how quickly they did it. Uh, it it's just spectacular uh, how well that's been received. How important is uh, technology? How important is technology in terms of combining real estate, sports venues, and how does it integrate or tie in together? I mean, I think everywhere you go now, you have to have top-end technology. So, uh, you know, having Wi-Fi available in public spaces is very important, uh, but it's more important for the team and their scoreboards and everything. I mean, I remember the first time I saw what they did in Dallas. I mean, those scoreboards are spectacular. Although I like that flag you have. What's what? Who's the who's the artist that did that big flag that looks like it's waving but it's not waving? To in, shame on me. I don't know the artist, okay. but I know All exactly right. which one you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it, it's obviously critical. But one interesting thing we're seeing, sort of post COVID, and I know we're still managing through the the virus, but we're finally even in Massachusetts. I think we're finally back to uh, attending events live and and people out and about. We we absolutely empirically have a younger audience, um, even at, at Fenway Park, um, which you know historically has had an older demo. Um, and we've, it's been really gratifying to see a young, diverse, energetic crowd in our building, uh, or in all of our buildings. And that's really exciting to think about, the, you know, breeding that next generation of fans in these historic traditional environments. But you better um, give them the opportunity to follow the game uh, and not necessarily watch the game because we all know from those of us who are parents I have 17 and 19 year old it's like they don't watch anything they follow everything right they're following along and you got to make sure that the experience at the ballpark provides the opportunity to do that and some of the examples we've, we've mentioned I think really uh, hit the mark I think you're spot on Sam I just think uh, this younger audience which we're all trying to get our hands around I've got that younger audience as my children but I throw in as technology the data. I mean, you got to communicate to these people. You got to figure out how you're going to want to communicate to them. Our deal even opened our eyes as ownership and our staff in the NFL that we did with Amazon and streaming and uh, how well that's done. And we just didn't have any expectation that it would uh, be as, uh, be as uh, successful uh, as it's turned out to be. And, I just think, boy, when you can communicate with your database uh, and you know how to mine your database and you know how to talk to them and do it the right way, it opens up everything, not just for your franchise and your season ticket holders, your fans, but real estate, any other businesses that you happen to tie into uh, what you're trying to get accomplished uh, as a franchise, as a brand, uh, the technology, as hard as it is for me to follow sometimes <laughs> as an almost 60 year old, uh, it's our future, uh, the technology, and you just have to embrace the technology and the data and how we, how we mine that data. You just got to be open-minded to it and ready, ready to embrace it. Great. Well, I think we're just about out of time, but I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, and uh, thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Appreciate it, Sam. Great. Appreciate it.